Good morning, everybody. Um, I think we'll make a start and we may well have others joining as we go on. Um, welcome, I'm Liz Cullen. Um, I'm Head of Programme for Maternity and Perinatal Mental Health for Hampshire and Thames Valley Clinical Network. Um, today is our first of our kind of smaller webinars. So we've been running our fortnightly COVID-19 webinar since April now. Um, but this webinar is focused specifically on maternal mental health services um, and the bid process for the early implementers and fast followers. So just a bit of housekeeping to start off with. Um, please, can you put your lines on mute and turn your videos off unless you're asking a question or entering into the discussion? It just helps with the quality of the line. Um, if you have the function, please feel free to raise your hand to ask a question or give feedback. Um, if you're not able to do that, either unmute yourself and ask it directly or put it into the chat box. Um, and please uh, do use the chat function. Um, but if possible, please, can you give your name, role and organisation either in the chat box or also when you ask a question so we know who you are? That would be great. OK. Thank you very much. Can I have the next slide, please? OK, so our agenda for today um, is we're going to go over um, the Maternal Mental Health Services National Overview, which Jenny, our clinical lead, is going to give. Um, and then we're going to spend the bulk of the time going through the bid requirements and the spreadsheet. Um, and there'll be lots of time for question, questions and discussion about that. I'm just going to post a question, which if you have the like function, um, I'm just posting the question where it says, have people had a chance to look at the bid guidance notes and spreadsheet that was sent out? And just to clarify, although there was an open invitation to this webinar, um, I think we put in our invitation that our target audience today is really looking at the specialist perinatal mental health services, the specialist perinatal mental health midwives, commissioners, and the local maternity system program managers, um, as those will be the key individuals that are going to be involved in the bid process um, for the maternal mental health services. Um, I've sent out the information in advance and really uh, the reason I'm asking the question is please be honest because depending on whether you've read it, had a chance to look at it and read it or not will depend on what detail that we might go into today. So um, if you haven't, that's fine. Don't worry, we can guide you through it. But if you have, just give me a, a thumbs up so that I, I know where to pitch it really today. Can I also do a little bit of a sense check in terms of uh, who we've got in terms of our attendees at the moment. So we are hoping to have attendees from each of the LMS footprint areas and I'm just going to run through them. If you're on the line um, from, uh, so I'm going to start off with SHIP LMS, can you either put in the chat box that you're here and what your role is or can you um, unmute yourself and let us know? So anybody from SHIP LMS area, either in terms of the LMS or specialist uh, perinatal mental health services, specialist perinatal mental health midwives or commissioners. Anybody from SHIP? Yes. Hi Liz, it's Charlie Marden. I'm the programme manager for SHIP. Hi Charlie, great to have you on this morning. Thank you. Hi Liz, it's Debbie Parkinson here. I'm the transformation manager for the SHIP LMS. Thank you Debbie. I've also seen um, Jane Bailey and Alison Wenzerall from the specialist team. So I'm I'm going to say I know they're here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Anybody from Frimley LMS and Frimley Specialist Perinatal Mental Health Services? Hi, I'm here. I'm Liz Hopkinson, Perinatal Mental Health Midwife at Frimley Park. Hi, Liz. Hi, Jane, Jane Lynch from, um, I'm the LMS lead. Morning, Jane. Morning. Hi, I'm Nancy, Project Support Officer for Frimley LMS. Thank you. Hi, Nancy. Hi, it's Becky. Um, I'm a pharmacist for the perinatal team in Berkshire, so we cover Frimley as well. Thanks, Becky. Okay, on to Bob LMS. 
Anybody from Bob LMS and supporting specialist perinatal mental health services? Hi, I'm Nicola Wiggins. I'm the specialist perinatal midwife in Oxford. Lovely. Welcome, Nicola. Thank you. Anybody else from Bob? Nope. OK. Um, Surrey Hartlands. Hi, I'm Julie. I've been asked about five minutes ago to, to jump on on behalf of Paulette Kerr, who's our programme manager. So I'm here for Surrey Heartlands. Thank you, Julie. We appreciate you joining us at very short notice. Thank you. Thank you much. Okay. Hi, I'm Abby Crutch. I'm the clinical lead for perinatal service in Surrey Heartlands, and we also cover Surrey Heath from Frimley. Lovely. Thank you. Hello, I'm Marion Heron, commissioning manager for Surrey Heartlands and the wider area. Lovely, thank you, Marion. Sussex and East Surrey. Hi, I'm Cecily Hollingworth. I'm one of the project managers in the Sussex LMS. Thank you, Cecily. Um, hi, I'm Simone Lane and I'm actually the Public Health Commissioner for East Sussex and Healthy Child Room, but I'm also stand, standing in for Ben Brown who's the lead public health consultant for on this area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel West, I'm the service manager for the Sussex and East Surrey Perinatal Service. Thank you, Rachel. I'm Sophie Mawson, I'm a perinatal mental health midwife for East Sussex Healthcare Trust and I can see that my colleague Mandy is here as well. Great, thank you. Cynthia. Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Mandy Asprey for East Sussex as well, perinatal mental health midwife. Lovely, thanks, Mandy. OK, and Kent and Medway. Hi, it's Claire Hayward. I'm Senior Commissioning Manager for Kent and Medway. Thank you, Claire. Hi, I'm Jenny Essex. I'm a newly appointed obstetric lead in perinatal mental health East Kent. Brilliant, thanks, Jenny. Um, Nisha Krishnan. Um, Perinatal Mental Health Lead in Obstetrics um, over at Nathan. Thanks, Nisha. Bosky Nair, Consultant Perinatal Psychiatrist uh, in West Kent. Lovely, thanks, Bosky. And Dorset. Hi, Liz. It's Hannah Nettle, Principal Programme Lead, um, Dorset LMS. And Hi. Hi Liz, um, we've got Ellie Venton on the phone as well, programme lead, and I believe Yagada's on the line as well. Super, thank you. So good representation. The good news is that all the, service, all the systems are represented, which is great. OK, so we will um, get started with Jenny's presentation and just, um, I guess, shouldn't start with apologies but there are some apologies in advance this is there's a lot of information to go through this morning and it is quite dry and there's no way around that but I think it's probably good for us to go through the detail of the information and have this opportunity for you to ask questions in preparation for when um, bids will need to be completed so um, it is a bit of a hard slog this morning but hopefully it will give the it give you the information that you need in order to fill out your bids as and when it comes to it. OK, I'm going to hand over to Jenny, who's going to just remind us uh, why this is um, key on the agenda. Morning, everybody. Um, some of the slides that I show will be familiar to you, but I think it's really important that we just sort of take a breath and remind ourselves why, why we're doing this. OK, can I have the next slide, please? So important to remember that there's still investment that we um, we're not finished yet. OK, we, we've done wave waves one and two, but we have um, we have a fair old way to go yet. Um, and also important to say that the women's scene in the maternal mental health services, as it's being called now, um, will be counted in the specialist team numbers. So there's an ambition that everybody will be seeing more women, but obviously this um, this work will count in those numbers. So next slide, please. 
So let's remind ourselves um, about what were called originally maternity outreach clinics, what are now called maternal mental health services, and what you can call them whatever you like once you start doing them. So there is obviously an opportunity locally to name them in a way that fits in with, with you, your service, your offer, um, so you don't have to stick with it. Um, so the ambition is is a good one, I think. It's about joint maternity and mental health and um, so important that we work collaboratively on this right from the start. Um, I've been in perinatal long enough myself to remember that how horrible it was when we used to get referrals for women who had experienced birth trauma and were still suffering from that who had experienced horrible um, losses of, of babies um, that, that they were really struggling to deal with. And these women would get referred to the service and we would have to turn them away and, and say, I'm, I'm so sorry, but we're not commissioned to do that. And referrers were like properly puzzled because they're thinking, well, if you don't do it, who does? Because you're the perinatal service. And it's always... I felt a really difficult conversation to say, no, I'm sorry, we're not commissioned to do that. So I'm really delighted that we're all going to be able to say, yes, we do do that. And um, this is a service we can offer. So as it says on here, it's for women experiencing mental health difficulties directly arising from or related to the maternity experience and aiming to Im integrate maternity, reproductive health and psychological therapy. And I think that there's deliberately left this quite broad because, again, it's very much open to local interpretation. So you may live in an area where you feel you're seeing enough of a certain thing that you need to focus on that, whereas in another part of the country that might not be an issue. And um, so I think it's, you know, that that's that's a joy as well, that there's a lot of opportunity for really getting this right for your women locally. Next slide, please. Um, and this slide is a little bit about what is expected to be in there. So um, I won't read all of it because the slides will be going out afterwards. Um, but it's a cohort of women that may benefit from access to perinatal mental health support beyond the offer that exists in IAP services. And goes beyond existing psychological support provided in maternity services or bereavement care but they may not have reached the threshold for the specialist teams. And I think um, we've always, there's, there's, there's a couple of things here. These services are absolutely not a replacement for good bereavement services. There's a certain amount of, 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 of um, offer that should already be happening within maternity. And it's so important that these new services aren't used to fill gaps that should be filled by something else. So we are focusing on bereavement at the next webinar so that we can properly look at what should already be on offer and what we're building on with the maternal mental health services. Um, we also know from working in services about these gaps we've all the way through existing services, wave one, wave two, people have always highlighted these tricky women that don't quite fit IAT, are too, probably too much for the health visitors to, to deal with, but historically haven't met the threshold for the specialist services. And this work is very much about who are these women, what do they need? Also, historically, not having a baby has been an exclusion for a perinatal service. And with these clinics, that is not an exclusion at all. So you, you may have suffered multiple loss. You may have suffered 
a um, whole series of failed IVF and needs some um, support with that. Um, so we're not working to traditional um, parameters that, that we're used to. OK, next slide, please. Jenny, can I just interrupt? Can I just remind everybody to put yourselves on mute um, because there's a bit of background noise at the moment. Thank you. Um, thanks, Liz. This slide is um, just a reminder of the original timescales, and I think it's worth um, having a, another look at this one because I think the timescales will be the same. Everything's just been shifted a quarter, if you get me. So what we're going to have to do is going to be within the same time scale. It's just been pushed back by COVID. So this, I think this slide is still relevant. Um, so please do ask um, questions as we go along. And we do have a lot of time at the end for questions as well. So um, I'm going to hand over to Liz now, I believe. I think that's my last slide. And Liz is going to go into I think a lot of detail time. about. Oh, have I? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Let's <laughs> do the next one then and then I'll do the handover. <laughs> OK, next slide, please. Fine. Here we go. So um, this is about the early implementer and fast follower system. Um, within the southeast, as it says, we've already had two expressions of interest from Hampshire and Kent. So that's lovely. But if there's any other systems that would like to become a fast follower, please do let us know um, because we'd love to be able to support you with this process. And being a fast follower does give you the opportunity to test out a model um, using the transformation funding. Because remember, all services have to be doing this by 2023. So if you can, um, jump in a little bit earlier and benefit from the transformation funding because it's brand new I think there'll be a lot of sort of testing things out and see if they work um, and see if it's it does fit you know what you were hoping it would do so um, if I would really recommend if, if you haven't sort of been in a position to go for early implementer that you really really consider fast follower and Liz and I are absolutely happy to, for people to email us, phone us to get some more information. OK, so now I'll hand over to Liz and um, she's going to take you through the detail of the um, bid requirements. Thank you very much, Jenny. So um, the paperwork that we've received and we have sent out um, to the specialist perinatal mental health services, the specialist perinatal mental health midwives, the LMS PMOs and commissioners um, is the reason we haven't sent it out to everybody on the distribution list for the webinar and we've just sent it to that targeted audience is it is still remains confidential and it is not guaranteed to be the final um, bid template and guidance. But for those of you that were on the webinar a fortnight ago when Giles Beresford as National Clinical Lead um, was on the call, he said it is likely to be that information and it is very unlikely to change um, very much. It might be tweaked slightly. So um, he encouraged us to send it out so that at least you know what is the expectation. So I'm just going to kind of go through that. I appreciate some of you will have had a chance to look through it, through it. Some of you may not have done yet, but it's really I'm just going to pull out some of the key points in terms of considerations of what you need to um, do either in preparation for your bid or actually include within the bid. OK, can I have the next slide, please? So, as I said, apologies, there is a lot of information, uh, partly so that you will have this to digest um, when you get the slide set um, and can go through it in your own time. But what I've tried to do is just pick out key elements and then summarise as well. So, um, all bids are required to have a named lead CCG um, and they'll be the per they'll be responsible for receiving and distributing funds on behalf of the partnership. But what is very clear is that the bids needed to be developed in collaboration. 
So this is a collaborative approach in terms of perinatal mental health and maternity services working together with the CCGs, local authorities, community and voluntary sector, um, and also the clinical networks, which is ourselves. Um, one thing that I think is really important is it needs to demonstrate in your expressions of interest, be it for the early implementers or the fast followers, um, how the proposal has been informed by the needs of the women, partners and families that you serve. So how it's been co-developed and a good way to, uh, I know many of you obviously already have service user engagement that you um, use for everything you do, but also accessing in terms of the maternity voice partnerships through the LMSs would be a good way to do that. And I know Jenny and I have been having some discussions about that um, and whether for some some gauging of information where we might have some general questions that would be um, pertinent for the whole geography of the southeast whether it would be worth us sending out a survey monkey so that we get some um, information back um, that spans the, the whole of the geographical area and you may also have specific things for your bid that you may also want to include so that's that's up for discussion and we can talk about that later in the discussion session um, there needs to be commitment to sustainably fund the services and for those of you that have been through the wave one and wave two process you will know that this is nothing new so there is an expectation and it is on the um, spreadsheet application um, that the CCGs will need to commit to sustainably fund the services and that's also part of the criteria um, in terms of whether bids will be successful or not. Um, and then also what they've asked is for um, services to take into account the indicative CCG baseline allocation in order to promote service sustainability. So there is long term plan money that is coming that will go into the baseline um, to fund these services longer term and they want uh, they're asking people to take that into account. OK, next slide, please. Um, I've just seen a question from Shirley. That's a very good point in terms of why are health visiting services not included? They should be. It would be my suggestion. Um, I don't know why they've been omitted from the guidance, but I would suggest that they absolutely are, are an integral part as they are an integral part of the local maternity systems. Um, we recognise, or uh, the national team recognise that funds are likely to include one-off development and implementation costs. And I guess some of the learning that Jenny and I have had from both the wave one and wave two processes um, for the specialist perinatal mental health community teams is sometimes that was missed off. Um, so people concentrated on what was the staffing of the actual services, but not on what needed to go in there in order to, to get to that point of service delivery. So, um, we would strongly, strongly recommend that within the bid process, you put in the development and implementation costs in terms of project management um, and implementation support in terms of the mobilisation uh, phase, also in terms of stakeholder engagement and considering workforce development training, communications that will go out in terms of advertising the new services um, and any inter, inter, I can never say this word, interoperability solutions in terms of IT and what have you, um, we would definitely recommend that that is all included in. OK, next slide, please. So to summarise, um, the expressions of interest need to be submitted on behalf of an SDP or ICS for the LMS area. Um, so it is a, a system approach to this rather than individual services putting in a bid. It needs to be from the system and it needs to have a nominated lead CCG. There needs to be very senior management commitment to this in terms of the sustainability of funding. Um, and, and that's required in order to release the transformation funding and in order for the bid to be agreed. Um, the transformation funding is for revenue only. Um, and as part of the uh, process in terms of um, accepting transformation funding, then um, the systems will commit to a programme of reporting and assurance um, to NHS England and improvement. Um, and one of the things that we 
have noted as a team and would encourage people to do is there will be set um, data that the, the NHSE and I will require for this in terms of numbers of women seen and, and what have you. But also we think it is really important to capture those wider aspects um, which may not be asked for, but in terms of um, partners that you may have interacted as part with as part of the services um, to really capture the wider effect of the service and its success. Um, and we can spend some time at a later date exploring that with services um, as to what our suggestions would be in terms of data capture. OK, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the parameters of the service, it's about clearly demonstrating the cohort, so the number of additional women that will benefit from the service, um, going back to the national ambition in terms of the increased number of women to be seen by specialist services. Um, also thinking about being really clear about what is your current service provision, what is your baseline, um, and then how the application responds to gaps in care. So it's about um, filling the gaps in care, um, is the key message for this. Um, as Jenny mentioned earlier, it's not about replacement for good bereavement. Um, it's not a replacement, should I say, for good bereavement care. And so um, it should uh, be an interdependency with bereavement pathways and rainbow clinics. Um, and as Jenny mentioned earlier, our next full webinar, um, which I believe is on the 29th of July, will focus on bereavement. Um, so we can give more information then. And then um, applicants are asked to explicitly give in their approach what the training, support and supervision needs are in terms of upskilling their workforce. So going back to those additional costs, which may be one off costs um, that I mentioned in a couple of slides earlier, it's about what money is needed to provide training, support and supervision to upskill the workforce in order to deliver this service. Thank you. Next slide, please. So uh, just to summarise, it's about the provision for the cohort, identifying who's going to benefit from these services and the number of women that will be accessing this care. So your baseline and what you what your predictions are, um, identifying and noting where the gaps are and how the transformation funding is going to address this and what is the proposal in terms of the improved outcomes and experiences for the women, partners and families that you serve. OK, next slide, please. So the service will need to um, meet the cohort of women giving birth in the area with moderate to, um, moderate sphere or complex mental ill health. It needs to have a multidisciplinary skill mix um, and identify how um, you are going to upskill your workforce in order to do that. Um, it needs to have timely access to evidence based specialist assessment and treatment um, in line with nice guidance. It needs to meet the needs of the local population, building on the learning from diverse co production. So that feedback that you get from your service users It needs to target the health inequalities in your in your area, um, demonstrate obviously the improvements and implement a trauma informed approach to care. And there's various things um, that you can use to support that in terms of giving you the baseline and the predictions of women that you will see in terms of the joint needs assessments. Um, the maternity one I know has just been updated. And if people don't have that, we can make sure that that gets sent out um, with the um, slides for this um, webinar. Next slide, please. OK, so in terms of the expectations for delivery, monitoring and evaluation, um, the early implementers that are successful with their expression of interest will be expected to mobilise as soon as possible. And even once their bid has gone in, they will be required to develop a more detailed project implementation plan within four weeks of submission. So. Normally what we've had in the past is you submitted your bid and then there's a bit of a waiting period to hear whether you're successful or not, and then you proceed. But the suggestion is um, that we will have already worked with you for the early implementers and also region. And so we will be expecting you to mobilise at that point. Um, 
In the first year, there will be support visits. And for those of you that have been through um, the wave one and wave two transformation funding um, process for the specialist perinatal mental health services, you'll be used to that in terms of the national teams and the regional um, teams and ourselves as the networks coming to do support visits throughout that first year. Um, and also that offers that opportunity to have share uh, share and showcase your local learning um, there are normally some national events as well in terms of bringing the early implementers together and then also the fast followers as they follow suit um, and then in terms of reporting they will obviously be the detailed implementation plans and then there will be quarterly monitoring reports um, and then obviously national activities to share the learning um, and evaluation. So um, again, for the specialist services, that will be very similar to what you've done previously in terms of uh, wave one and wave two. So in terms of your numbers of um, women through the services, um, uh, you know, and in terms of your where you are in terms of your trajectories. OK, next slide, please. So um, in terms of how you, the bids are going to be assessed, um, the appraisal criteria is um, the proposals will be assessed against the value for money framework covering key uh, three key themes. So outcomes, both um, in terms of clinical outcomes, patient needs and experience, safety, quality and the sustainability of the service. Um, resources in terms of the resourcing of the service and then the risks in terms of, um, you know, what's the ability to achieve value, um, collect the appropriate information, expand the workforce, you know, is it realistic? Um, ensuring that the appropriate skill mix is, um, is, is gained and building relationships across the system. And hence why the um, expressions of interest for the early implementers are for services who already have some uh, something in establishment so that they can run with that rather than starting from scratch. OK, next slide, please. So there are lots of resources out there in order to support your expression for interest. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is just three that I've picked out. But um, on the guidance um, information, it's obviously got um, a list of more, inf you know, more resources that can support you. The Embrace reports will also support um, this, also the joint needs assessments, as I've mentioned earlier. Um, but there is a wealth of information on the NHS collaboration platform um, for maternal mental health services. If people do not have access to that, um, we will make sure that the link goes out again because you need to register for that. Um, Giles uh, shared the link and I think the link was on our um, slides from our webinar a fortnight ago, but we'll make sure that gets shared again. There's also the mental health LTP analytical tool, which is on the collaboration platform. And I'll show you, um, I've got a slide on that in a second. And also an example of an indicative workforce model that should be able to help you. So next slide, please. So this is a slide that Giles shared last time in terms of the um, LTP online analytical tool, where CCGs can work out what their funding would be in terms of uh, mental health funding contribution to these services. Now, some of you may have picked up from um, our earlier webinars and other information that has been sent out that the um, these services are due to be dual um, funded through maternity and perinatal mental health. Um, mainly, um, it should be said through perinatal mental health funding um, national monies, but there is a maternity contribution. Um, Jenny, Anita and myself have been on the case to try and ascertain exactly what level of funding that will be from maternity. So the analytical tool here that's on the screen will give you um, an indicator of the perinatal mental health funds, but we do not have a clear indicator yet of what the maternity funding contribution will be to this. Um, but there is an assumption that obviously we will have that when the bid process um, probably starts. Um, so just bear in mind there will be a top up from maternity on this. Okay. Um, 
so the link there will work to take you through to your CCG level in order to work out your um, funding from a mental health perspective. Next slide, please. And then this is the example indicative um, workforce um, model based on 10,000 deliveries, um, which is in the guidance, um, uh, which we will resend following uh, the webinar today. OK. Next slide, please. Now that was um, a whistle stop tour, but lots of information there. Does anybody have any questions queries at this stage before we actually go into the spreadsheet, which is what is the actual application. I stunned everybody into silence with the amount of information. Is that what people were expecting in terms of the guidance or? So uh, Susie's just asked, does it need to be an existing service provider? I think there is an expectation that it is building on um, existing uh, specialist perinatal mental health services. Yes, but Jenny, correct me if you would like to say otherwise. But um, Jenny Walsh, do you want to comment on that? I was, I was typing my response, so uh, sorry. So that's exactly how I understand it, Liz, that it's definitely coming down to an extending um, specialist perinatal mental health services in collaboration with maternity. Um, I know we've had a question about health visiting. I think there's so much about this work that is about collaboration, and I think health visiting, IAT, absolutely have to be involved in the discussions around this because the thresholds for those services are going to be influenced by this new service so there's going to have to be a lot of probably much more sort of system-wide working than perhaps we've had and making sure that the, those boundaries between services and thresholds that we really understand them because they're going to be changing so um yeah, and also, of course, in each area, the third sector offer will be slightly different. So you need to know what's already out there and how you're going to interface with all of that. So it's quite a tricky dance. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question from Sarah. Um, I can't see in the chat box. Sarah, are you from Mind? Is that correct? Oxfordshire Mind? Sarah Kelly? Yeah. Yes, yes, I am. Um, <laughs> so what we would say with the paperwork at the moment is absolutely um, mind need to be involved in terms of the um, working with the system to develop bids. But we would ask that the paperwork is not shared outside at the moment um, because it is not the final. Um, it's not being signed off as the final um, information. So hence why we've only sent it out to a targeted group so far. Um, you will have copies of the slides, but um, we will wait until we get the final bid template, if that's OK. Oh, yeah. sorry, Sarah, I've given you the wrong information there. I do apologise <laughs> for that. No, sorry. 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 <laughs> sorry, Jenny, I didn't realise you'd replied. Sorry. That's absolutely yeah. understood. Uh, Fine. <laughs> Which is NHSE are doing their usual cautious thing as to how wide it goes in case they tweak it. Yeah. OK, but certainly get involved in the discussions, please do. OK. Any other questions? And I'm going to ask Jenny to. We've, got, this as well. um, um, we've got one from Nisha about recommended um, modalities for birth trauma. And I know we've got some psychologists on the call. Um, so could I uh, do a shout out to people that are working in this field to say to, to answer that question from Nisha. I know Rachel Davis. Hi. Hello, can you hear me, Jenny? Sorry, yeah, yeah. can I just confirm, you're talking about recommended treatments for, yes, for birth, birth trauma. So, yeah, so, at the, so sorry, just so I briefly introduce myself, I'm a Rachel Davis, a clinical psychologist working across SHIP, and we are doing a pilot project at the moment developing a birth trauma pathway and the key treatments that we're using 
and which are under the NICE guidelines are trauma-focused CBT and then EMDR, mm. which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. So, okay. so this is what, sorry, thank you for that, because I was just wanting to, to when because we are looking at it at the same time in KMPT yeah. and meets and Tunbridge Wells, and these are the two modalities that I'm more familiar with, but there has been other modalities that have been raised and we were, I was just, I'm obviously an obstetrician by training, so um, I was just wondering what the, what to invest in if we needed to. <laughs> so what are the other modalities? Yeah, at the moment, the modalities that we, I'm more familiar with are the trauma-based CBT that we get through IAPT. Yeah. Um, EMDR, the psychologists available to do that type of work are limited. And a lot of the times they don't want to work with women who are already pregnant. So we do have um, limited providers that I personally work with. Um, there might be people that means the perinatal psychiatry services are aware of. Um, and then there was some some people have raised psychodynamic therapy as a, as an option. And and so I was just wanting to know as psychologists what your preferred options for me EMDR and CB is trauma-based CBT are the ones that I'm most familiar with. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think Samantha, yeah, so those, those are the ones that we are using and currently for women where they are closer to pregnancy or to delivery date, what we are doing at the moment and our current model is providing sort of support coping skills, so things like grounding techniques and those approaches to help them through the delivery and then looking at potentially the more in, intense sort of trauma specific mm -hmm. focus afterwards. Um, and any thoughts on, so personally we've had a lot of midwives um, who've had um, funding for rewind therapy. It's it, That is new to me, but it seems to have worked for some of my patients. And we personally have quite a few midwives who have been trained in that, that we want to tap into this into these pathways. So what are, are people's experience or thoughts on those, on, on that specifically? H Hannah Wilson, can I put you on the spot just to say a bit about um, Rewind? Do you um, yes, you can, Jenny. <laughs> I was just typing a response in the chat box <laughs> about the Rewind therapy. Um, and I'm not surprised that some people benefit from it, of course, but of course, as a psychologist, I'm very concerned that um, that if if we're offering a psychological intervention for a psychological disorder such as birth trauma, um, a psychological injury such as birth trauma, then we need to make sure that it's delivered by an accredited therapist and um, in order that a holistic full assessment is done to make sure that is the most appropriate treatment option at this time for this individual. Um, and that those therapists are um, accredited with the appropriate bodies so they have that professional accountability. And also that the delivery of the training of these interventions are, tr are delivered by accountable professional bodies. Mm, okay. So yeah, so this is this was some of my thoughts. I mean, it's worked really well for women who are pregnant at the moment and who couldn't really fit under the IAPT thresholds. Though they're the, the kind of like the lost tribe, some of them. So it's worked for some groups of them. Um, yeah, and so I, I guess, guess I'm just we've I'm just in it. That's I I'm mean, the agree. reason it's not a nice recommended treatment is because it doesn't have, you know, the current evidence base to to yeah. to reach that standard of being able to, you know. Of being a nice accredited treatment and the reason why i'm asking is when we're do talking about this collaborative work between maternity health visiting and psychologists uh, some of the midwifery and health visiting colleagues seem to be accredited and trained in this that in this modality yeah they are trained in that but what professional body are, are accrediting those training if you see what i mean mm -hmm. you know they you know these bodies are, are accrediting themselves so I guess there's a that mm -hmm. bigger professional accountability here about actually making sure that things that are being offered have got um, a base that is sound and secure and I guess what 
I guess some of the techniques I know in rewind therapy are, are the sorts of things that Rachel was just talking about, which is the grounding, mm -hmm. which are all very, you know, they've got a sound base. But I guess it's about ensuring that people delivering it, if they are going to be delivering it, have got very good supervision structures in place from an accountable professional clinical psychologist. OK, so, yeah, I think they do, actually. I think um, the, the midwives and specialist nurses. Yeah, so I was just wondering in terms of this bid, that's actually some of the things that I'm tapping into and using at the moment. It doesn't seem like that's something that would be seen as an accredited modality. Can I yeah, just... Yeah, I think it's about to sticking to the, the, nice, the nice, nice guidelines. Sure. OK, that's, that's fine. It's just for me to know, really, because this is in my area of expertise. I'm just seeing what women are accessing at the moment and just trying to see what. And, we and I guess although individuals do. might have very good results, but I mm -hmm. guess it's about making sure that that but actually what we need is um, robust clinical trials to tell us that actually that's not just a one off subjective experience. Sure. That we're using okay. good evidence about about what treatments we choose to deliver. Okay, all right. So I can see there's stuff. a few hands up here. Um, what if we carry on with the spreadsheet and then we pick up the some questions at our question time at the end? Because I think um, what the clinics will hopefully offer is a lovely opportunity for this all to come together and there may well be a place for midwives delivering some part of this, but now they'll be able to be supervised, hopefully by psychologists within the maternal mental health services. So I think there's there's um, an opportunity for it to become much more robust. Um, so but if we if we go to the bid and then we can pick up more questions um, at the end. OK. Oh, Sam wanted feedback. Please, can I feedback before I leave? She's saying. Do you want to to say say that now, then, Sam? Just before yeah. If if, if that's okay, it was just a really really quick thing. Um, in Berkshire, that people are probably aware, we have quite a robust birth trauma pathway, um, and our birth trauma clinicians only use EMDR and trauma focused CBT. And I think what we've noticed is that the vast majority of women who do have PTSD from birth um, also have complex trauma. And what concerns me is, is when people are trained in Rewind about kind of being able to manage the complexity of trauma and um, past historical trauma that often comes up. Um, so that was just some feedback really, but also women who are pregnant. We do psychological birth care planning that we do with maternity. So we're getting really good feedback from our plans. And um, I think we're gonna try and write it up as um, either sort of a piece of narrative or potentially a piece of research but our care plans are going really quite well in terms of women feeling safe psychologically during their pregnancy and during birth so I just wanted to mention it. Brilliant thank you Sam and um, so I'm, I'm not ignoring you other guys but let's just get back to the bid process and we'll pick up some more of the questions at the end. So sorry to Diane, because I see you've got your hand up and, and somebody else who I can't see who it is. But we will, um, just for time purposes, we'll crack on now with the, um, with the, with the spreadsheet. OK, back to Liz. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so the spreadsheet is what will be your bid template and as we say this is not being signed off as the final version um, but it's expected that it, this will pretty much be the content it might get tweaked slightly um, but I think if people started to work towards um, populating this you're not going to be far wrong um, it's, it might be cop um, copy and pasting into slightly different boxes but this you know the kind of core content is what we're expecting um, so the cover sheet just runs through in terms of completing the pro, uh, the proposal um, and uh, reviewing the guidance notes, which I've gone through in my earlier slides and the appraisal criteria. And then also in terms of the um, information sources that you might want to access, as I've previously mentioned. Um, can we just scroll down, please, Sarah? There's also in terms of um, the type of provision um, in terms of 
what's expected um, in terms of um, activity to meet the overall commitment uh, for perinatal mental health and the long term plan. Um, and then a little bit about service provision so um, and service principles. So that's just kind of, again, kind of recapping on the guidance, which is in the, the bigger document that we've been through in the slides. OK, um, next tab is then on to sign off. And really, the sign off process is really to ensure that it is a system wide approach and that everybody has come together to collaborate in order to um, agree the bid process. So um, kind of very much just putting in key details, but about um, who is the lead STP board's name, who's the lead CCG, um, the what region you're under, which will be southeast, um, the provider trust and exec approval. Um, so I think it, what I would want to, um, I guess, um, in terms of advice is making sure that with the bid when we get the final timescales for delivery that people factor this in in terms of getting the appropriate sign off um so i know that when we did uh, both wave one and wave two that actually um maybe finalizing the bid was fine but then getting the sign off from the relevant people um, was quite a challenge so you will need to factor that into your timescales in order to do that um because there's a number of people that need to go on this in terms of exec approval name at CCG level, trust level, um, also in terms of us at the, the clinical networks. Um, and then obviously the sign off in terms of service sustainability from the CCGs and in terms of capital funding and that. So um, I guess please do make sure, as I say, I, I can't emphasize enough, this all takes time to get those signatures. So, uh, so you, you know, almost the, bid itself needs to be finished um, a reasonable time in advance to then send it around to get everybody to sign um, sign it and agree it. Um, and, uh, you know, as we did with wave one and wave two funding bids, we will happy, we will happily support you with this process as well. OK. Um, right, move on to the next one, which is existing provision. Um, so this is again, again, back to your baseline um, in terms of detailing your existing workforce within your services um, and then funding for existing services and then looking at um, what's your birth rate across your CCGs um, and what is the number of um, women currently accessing services um, that would be identified in terms of benefiting from maternal mental health services. So really that's just capturing all your baseline information that you already have. Um, okay. The proposed narrative is the chunkiest bit of the proposal, of the bid process. Um, and this is, um, can we just scroll up please? So this is kind of giving the detail of your proposal really. This is the main chunk of it. Um, so in terms of your rationale, um, so the proposal is that the same bid template will be used for both the early implementers and fast followers. So you would need to identify which one you're going to be, of which, as we've said, um, at the moment, we are have only been contacted by Hampshire and Kent in terms of being early implementers. And so it's um, most of you would be looking to be fast followers. Um, Kind of again going into more detail about the description about your existing services and your baseline um, and your uh, specific offer that you will be giving um, and as usual part of the challenge with this is is the limitation in terms of words and the amount of detail that needs to be provided okay um, if we can scroll down it also again asks in terms of your patient cohort in terms of the additional number of women expected to receive care um, in the two um, in the following two years um, uh, and information about that and how you're going to identify them the referral process so thinking about your operating model in terms of um, getting these women into services um, and then how the bid responds to the needs of the women and families in your local population um, in terms of diverse co-production, that's so building again on the information that you will have received in terms of going out to your service users um, and getting a sense of what they, um, what their needs are, what they want from these services. Okay, scroll down, please, Sarah. 
Um, and again, about capturing uh, and collecting data and monitor monitoring and evaluating activity and outcomes. Um, and again, there will be, as I mentioned earlier, there will be core data that the national team wish to collect, but it's also thinking about what are those wider data, um, that wider data that would be useful to capture in terms of the evaluation process um, and also will have an impact on wider numbers in terms of thinking about um, partners and dads and uh, wider families. OK, um, and then also detailing in terms of the approach to staff training and supervision. So um, upskilling the workforce um, in order to deliver the service and then the mobilisation and governance and also thinking about that interface in terms of governance between perinatal mental health and maternity um, is going to be key to this. OK, um, next tab, please. So um, this is about your finances in terms of the proposal for expenditure. And as we've done previously with wave one and wave two funding bids, we would really encourage you to work with your finance teams in order to um, develop this. Um, really important to get them on board at an early stage um, in order to support this and for them to kind of fill this bit out working with you. Um, and it looks at... Um, non-recurrent um, uh, spend for both uh, or, or funding for 2020-21 and 21-22 financial years. Um, if we just scroll down, I think it also has, um, so it's got workforce costs um, and also non-pay costs as well. Um, and descriptors for that. Lovely. And next tab, please. So um, this gives the costings um, for workforce, but if you scroll right to the top and maybe over to the left, um, you'll notice that this is the annual cost of workforce for 2018-19 prices. So um, these are out of date and our assumption is that this will be updated on the final um, bid template that, that comes out so that you can um, cost up your staffing. Um, for that. OK. And that has all the different elements of um, staffing and, and training costs. OK, so that is the spreadsheet and the bid template. Are there any questions about that? So for those of you that were involved in wave one and wave two funding applications, it's very similar. Um, any comments or questions? No, self-explanatory. Any concerns about um, getting the information in order to populate it? Can I ask a question? Yeah, please do. Um, it's, it's just about who the kind of cohort of women might be because um, uh, as a specialist midwife, I come across a lot of women who kind of fall between the gap in that they're not under perinatal, so they're not necessarily identified um, as being in, within the sort of perinatal mental health services, but, are you know, quite often late in pregnancy, suddenly um, trauma history um, arises and um, they um, are not, yeah, they're not under the perinatal service. So in terms of gathering the data from the existing services, I tend to see those women. Those women are not necessarily seen through the perinatal service. And the same with the women who are maybe under a CMHT, who, um, uh, because they're under a CMHT, are not taken on by the perinatal service necessarily. Um, and I find that there's, these are the two groups of women who are falling. They're not classified, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think, um, Jenny, feel free to come in at this point. Um, I think some of it is about, li about looking at... Um, doing some audit work now in preparation for actually doing the bid in terms of what numbers you you think are predicted in terms of those you know those women that do currently fall through the gap um, some of that will be will have depending on areas in terms of the psychology bid that's been going on within Hampshire will have captured some of that um, some of those numbers um, Jenny I don't know if you want to yeah so was that you Susie was that you um talking just then about yeah yeah, from yeah. Sunny, yeah. Sunny, sorry, hospital. Um, 
yeah well, thank you for that i think it's it's people like yourself um and other stakeholders within the perinatal pathway that are going to be absolutely vital to the um planning work that goes into the bid because you're absolutely right this is new for perinatal services these are not women that they're currently seeing so we need to know who they are and we need to know what the issues are yeah. for them so you know you midwives um specialist health visitors gps um cmhts as you said third sector all of that information we're going to have to um rake through and find out because you're the people that know because you're dealing with them because they you're absolutely right they haven't been under the um perinatal mental health services so yeah we're definitely you know people will be seeking out their specialist midwives to um garner your views on this okay good and I think it's a partly why we wanted to. So we don't have exact exact timescales yet. We're we're expecting imminently for um, them to be released, but we wanted to present this now in order that you have that opportunity to start doing that groundwork because actually it will it will take a while to do, um, and so put you in the best position possible for when you do need to submit the bids. Uh, Cecily's got her hand up. Thank you. Um, I'm just a little bit concerned that this is going to come out at the beginning of the summer holidays mm -hmm. when our key stakeholders are all going to be away <laughs> with family and things. Um, that is, we know it's happened before. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's any reassurance around that about um, about that and also partly because we've been planning a workshop with all our with all our stakeholders I at maternity parental mental health the whole caboodle um we had been thinking October we'll, we'll move it to September <laughs> um but but I am a bit worried that that, that that even that will be too late um I can't offer any um reassurance although that has absolutely been what we have fed back to the national team that that's our concern that actually they give us which we know has happened previously in their previous wave bids where they've given us what looks like six weeks but actually that's four weeks of august two weeks craziness in september trying to pull this together so we have kept giving that feedback and particularly i think this year um, we have been in, in unprecedented times and many services are being encouraged to um, ensure that their staff take annual leave, you know, over summer in preparation for what might be a second surge. Um, so we will continue to give that feedback and, and uh, Jenny, Anita and I are on a national call on Friday. So we will um, also pass back your concerns Brilliant. about that. Um, but I can't offer any guarantees, sadly. But I think what we felt was if we put this out so that at least people can start doing some work on it, then hopefully it, you know, it, it gives them more lead in time, really, yeah. um, ready for when it comes. Yeah. Right. OK, thank you. Um, how did people feel about Liz's suggestion earlier that we do a sort of regional MVP survey monkey? Or, you know, encourage the MVPs to um, do that on our behalf or on your behalf. I think that could work really well. Um, our MVPs are awesome. They do such a great job um, uh, with us. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure they'd be up for sharing. And I think it was developed regionally. It makes sense to do it once rather than everyone doing their own yeah. thing. We need to do it. So I think that could be helpful. So I think um, we probably need to do some work all together about what are the questions we want to ask, what are the, what's the feedback that we need. But we thought it just might be, uh, you know, rather than everybody doing their own little survey, if we, I think at this stage, we probably are going to be asking very similar information. Um, so we just thought it might be an easier way of, of doing it and capturing it in one hit that everybody can use. Yeah, great, definitely. Yeah, that's seems to get a thumbs up in the chat box as well. So we'll look to do that. OK. Any other questions regarding the um, template itself? No. 
OK, I think what we'll do is we'll go on um, if we can go back to the slides um, and then uh, Jenny has just put up some kind of um, kind of key points for consideration really in terms of um, things to consider and um, hopefully that will add to our kind of discussion and um, questions. So if we can have the next slide, please. And the next slide again. Lovely. Thanks, Liz. And um, well done you. That was a lot of <laughs> lot of stuff that you had to had to get across. Um, Thank you for staying with me on that painful <laughs> journey. <laughs> so here are some um, things that I've collated from talking to various stakeholders across the system. Um, just to look at or start looking at some of the gaps and um, the first on the list is was actually from a conversation with Hannah Wilson and I, I think this is so important if we're going to be working with women with birth trauma so we're going to be getting a lot of information in about what caused it then we really need to be learning from that and dealing with the causes of trauma and I think that Hannah made such a fantastic point to say that that I, I really wanted to capture it and suggest that any um, any of these um, new services are going to look and audit the causes of birth trauma and consider systematic reviews so that we're not just treating but we're learning and we're dealing with, with the causes and hope hopefully in, for some people reducing it. We obviously need to think about survivors of childhood sexual abuse and trauma informed approaches. Um, and I think there's a there's a lot of scope to start looking at, at system wide trauma informed approaches. Um, so let's keep that on the agenda. Um, the there's a very strong message from the national team about women who have babies removed. And I know that a lot of perinatal mental health services already have robust pathways for these women. But what about in maternity and do those pathways, you know, overlap, join up? Um, who is keeping an eye on these women? Because we know that a proportion of these women do go on to complete suicide. So it's very important that we've got something in place. Um, obviously, we've had feedback from midwives about tocophobia and needle phobia. Um, what about those women who frequently attend day units with sort of non-specific problems that you can't quite put your finger on? Is there a point in their journey where it, you think about referring them on to something else just to see what else might be going on for them? Um, and obviously, women who've had failed IVF or multiple miscarriages and neonatal were talking to us about the, the difficulty of women who have multiple births where one or more baby dies and, and the impact with that. And of course, our neonatal colleagues are another stakeholder for these new services that perhaps we haven't worked as closely with before. Could I have the next slide, please? And then that's sort of a bit about the the what and this is a bit about the the sort of who and, and other just other things to think about um what disciplines should be included um you know there's there's a lot of scope now a lot of us are working more with peer support workers with non-medical prescribers is there a role to link in with our iap services um what about physio um you know how how is that all going to hang together um you need to really know your own area you need to know what third sector organizations you've got and what they're doing what they're contributing how are you going to work with them and what will the pathways look like um and how do you let your other stakeholders know about this because 
it's new and the thresholds are going to change. So there's a big bit of educational work that needs to be done. And if you don't already have an educator role, you need to consider allocating time for this in your bid because don't underestimate the importance of that. If it's new and the thresholds have changed, you have to be able to communicate that to other people and not just about stakeholders. What about the women? What about the women? How are you going to let women know that there's something new available to them? And what about those women that are already marginalised by our services? How do you communicate something new and different to them? So it links in with stuff that we've talked about on other webinars about um, hard to reach groups or hard to access services. And we really need to think about how we're going to communicate this across um, communities. So um, that that's just some sort of some things to get you thinking and get you it's absolutely not an exhaustive list but this was sort of some preliminary work that we did with um talking to other stakeholders and just flagging up some issues and there's a lot of stuff already in place um but we need to remember that particularly that message about how are you going to communicate this both to to referrers and to women themselves. So um, we've got just under, my maths isn't marvellous, we've got a bit of time left, I won't try and do the maths and talk at the same time. So I'll put it back to the floor for um, questions and I can see Yagda you've got your hand up so um, go for it. Maybe you come off mute and go for it. In. Sorry, can you hear me now, Jenny? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, um, I just wanted to really pick up on what um, Hannah was saying earlier about um, about supervision and and the types of um, interventions that that we're offering. Um, I mean, I, I think that um, supervision is a real issue, and I think you, that there is there isn't much capacity within IAPT and within exist existing perinatal services to, to offer that supervision and it's really vital um, for um, staff that are going to be undertaking these new roles um, and for the women that are going to be receiving um, the therapy. Um, we're really struggling in perinatal to get supervision for our own psychologists um, so I think that that's something that for commissioners please can you bear that in mind and you know, it's not just a couple of hours here and there. It's really important that the supervision is, it's good, professional, adequate supervision in the interventions that we're going to be using. Um, I just got a couple of points. I'll try and get them all in as quickly as possible. Um, third sector, we've got some amazing third sector partners, but also we need to be careful about people that are presenting themselves as potential partners. We need to make sure that we cast an eye on what they're offering and, and are they qualified to offer what they say that they're going to. Um, we, we got really caught out years ago when we first set up down here in Dorset with a service that was set up to treat women that had been survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Um, and when, when we actually looked into it, um, the people that were offering the service weren't trained to offer those interventions and there certainly wasn't any supervision and women that had come through that service for second babies with us were more traumatized after that treatment so I just want to kind of you know err, err on caution when we're looking at um, our third sector partners please can we have OTs as well as physios um, often we forget about the um, what OTs can provide within maternity Educator roles, definitely. We've um, got an educator here in Dorset and um, I don't know what we'll do without her. And it's a real shame we didn't have her years ago. Um, her role's just really invaluable. Um, that was it, really. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Yagada. That's all really good stuff. And um, I think, you know, we, we've all probably had our fingers burnt with supervision and haven't um, allowed ourselves enough um, 
funding to, to do this adequately. And this is absolutely the opportunity. So make sure that you're factoring in enough sessions um, of the right grade of person who can hold all this together because they're going to be working with a lot of complexity. OK, have we got any other questions? I'm just looking around in the chat box now. Anybody got any questions about the process? Because now's your chance, although if you think of anything afterwards, um, Liz and I are happy to take emails or have conversation with individuals if that's helpful. We, um, that's a really good point, Jenny. So we didn't have, um, we had asked for questions or queries in advance um, and I'm sure um, we didn't really get any and I'm sure that's due to you having time and capacity to go through the documents. But now you've had a bit of a walk through them and you've got time to, um, you know, again, reflect on them in your own time. Please do feel free to send um, any comments or questions to uh, the generic uh, email account, which will come up in a minute. Um, it will come up on uh, the penultimate slide um, and then Jenny and I will field them and either answer them directly or um, also forward them to the national team. That's the email account. Yeah. Susie, do you want to elaborate on your question in the chat box about um, needs of fame communities? I probably can't type quick enough, so I'll just quickly say I just yeah. wondered, um, uh, you know, the, the BME community um, often are harder to reach and um, harder to invite into services. Um, and I just wonder what kind of um how the the uh the proposal is considering this yeah so, i think that's yeah. really important to um if, if you think back to the hard to reach presentation that we did a little while ago and then previous to that the um amazing speakers that we had about the bame issues during covid um, I think for me, the biggest, most important thing any of you can do is to have that baseline of the community that you work in so that you know who you should be seeing. And if your current services aren't seeing them, your new services won't either. You're not doing something already to include those people. So, and sometimes it's about getting out there and finding how to reach them if if your normal methods of communication aren't working do something different don't keep doing the same old thing and hope it will change because it won't if they haven't found it now they're not going to find the new stuff so just get out there and talk to the right people and find out where the watering holes are and how you're going to find these people you know where are the community centers what websites what facebook groups and just do some groundwork. And if you need to factor some time for that into the bid, it will be money well spent. Absolutely, absolutely. And certainly going back and it's on one of the earlier si slides, it says to, you know, about targeting health inequalities within the local area. There's a wealth of work going on um, across the system at the moment, isn't there, in terms of uh, BAME, and particularly thinking about numbers within maternity, um, and the LMSs are doing quite a lot of work on that. So. Yeah, coming together as your systems to look at what bits of work you're already doing and how that can, um, you know, influence and um, provide you with information that you will require for the bid. Can I ask a question? How are people feeling about being a fast follower? Do people feel that they're going to be ready to throw their hat? in the ring to be a fast follower or are people anxious about that? Hi Liz, it's Becky from the Berkshire team. I think um, Sam has sent an email to Jenny to just say we've got quite a lot of staff changes at the moment, six or seven new staff in the next two or three months um, and we're really short at the moment so I think we are really keen to join in but end of the year, beginning of next year is looking more realistic for us. 
That sounds yeah. sensible, Becky. One of our suggestions has been to the national team, so it had been proposed that the process would be um, in parallel. So they would ask for early implementers and fast followers at the same time. And what our feedback has been both to the region and nationally is that actually, given the year that we've all had, probably there needs to be a bit of a gap between the early implementers and the fast mm -hmm. followers. So people have time to do this groundwork and also prepare services. Yeah, OK. Um, Jenny, uh, Jenny Cook, you've got your hand up. Yeah, hi there. Hi there. I'm from um, Sussex in East Surrey. I think we, we kind of echo what Berkshire is saying. We're, we're really keen. At, you know, we, obviously, there's a massive need for this service, but um, we've got a lot going on at the moment, just maintaining our current service, making sure we can provide a sort of high quality specialist perinatal service um, and incorporate the long term plan sort of changes. Um, so we've got a lot going on there um, and, and we don't we don't want to bite off more than we can chew and then risk kind of um, not being able to do the core stuff that we need to be doing. So I think um, end of the year certainly sounds like a better uh, time frame for us. And, and so I think we, we probably will throw our hat in the ring to be a fast follower. But um, it, yeah, later would be better for us. Yeah, and I think something to remember, Jenny, is that. Oh, sorry. Can you mute yourself? A horrible echo thank you um yeah something to remember is that i think with the transformation funding you do get that opportunity just to play around with it a bit and see what you do need so you could start small and you know i know for um ship lms having the psychology pilot who've already tested out certain things has been a lovely springboard into becoming an early implementer so you you could use the fast follower opportunity to do something on a smaller scale, but to be clear in, in the bid that you're going to grow it over time. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting point, actually, that you don't have to use all the money <clears throat> immediately. If you don't want to, you can do something smaller. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, th that's interesting. I suspect once you get going, though, it'll be difficult not to just use all the money. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> And Shirley's put something in the chat box about um, including specialist health visitors. Absolutely. You're going to be such an important part of this pathway. Um, so I think that, yeah, I hope that goes without saying, Shirley, but I will just say do include your specialist health visitors in the discussions. I mean, if your um, if your network has been functioning, you should have you should be having these opportunities and 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 it it may not have been in the format that you're used to because of covid but there's certainly scope to um convene some meetings um to, with this as a focus so that you can have those discussions but really important to keep health visiting on board we've got some other hands up i think i'm not sure yagadu is that a new hand or an old hand that's up <laughs> Oh, uh, that was an old hand then. Um, and I think, yeah, OK, we've answered Jenny. OK, brilliant. OK. So um, I do hope that's been useful. I do appreciate um, there was a lot of information and it is quite dry. So apologies for that. Um, but do come back to us with questions or queries about the process. Obviously, as soon as we have information about when it will officially launch and if they update any of the guidance or information or the bid template, we will send it out as soon as we have it. Um, just a reminder that the next webinar on the 29th of July is a full webinar. Um, so um, that will be um, including all our um, stakeholders um and is focusing on bereavement um do you, it would be helpful for us to have some feedback because this is the first one that we've done as a kind of more um specialist webinar focusing on a specific area so do let us know whether it's been useful or not um it's always important to have that feedback to consider what we do in the future and thank you for your time